Okay, today I want to get through the rest of this um, overview of, of these um, models of the atom in section one of the chapter. So I went back a couple of slides just to remind you of Bohr's model, um, where we kind of left off uh, yesterday. I know we talked briefly about Schrodinger, but um, Bohr's model has energy levels. They use the analogy like a ladder. Um, the electron can orbit at this energy right here, a low amount of energy. If I heat it up or pass electricity through it or hit it with light energy, I can make the electron jump up to this energy level. It has higher energy now. It got there by absorbing this much energy, the difference between them. If I leave it alone, it could drop back down to the, the lowest energy, what we call the ground state, and release that energy as, as, a, as a particular type of light. Um, then we talked yesterday for neon, it's reddish orange light and, and so on. Um, or I can give it more energy and jump it up to the next level and the next and the next and so on. Um, so each level is an orbit the electron could be in. So if the electron's in this low level, it's orbiting somewhere close to the nucleus. When it jumps up to this higher level, it's orbiting a little further from the nucleus and, and so on. So we still have electrons orbiting like planets around the nucleus, but now they're limited to certain specific orbits corresponding to these specific energies. Whereas Rutherford's old model, they could orbit anywhere they felt like orbiting. So that was um, Bohr's model. We talked about that yesterday. Um, now we go on to the quantum model that Erwin Schrodinger came up with. Um, the, the, we'll talk more about this later, but um, be, in the years between Bohr and Schrodinger, uh, there was a lot of theoretical calculations done for exactly how the electron was moving around the atom. And they kept coming up with, this isn't working. Um, trying to model an exact circular orbit around the nucleus just didn't work mathematically. Um, and so Schrodinger went off the deep end and modeled the electron as a wave function. Rather than as a little particle zipping around the nucleus, he treated it as like a wave, a ripple going around the nucleus. Um, the math there became rather intense. And again, we're not going to look at the math here because it's just ugly. Um, but we can look at the results of it. Um, notice, by the way, he limited his description to the hydrogen atom, so did Bohr for that matter, um, because it's the simplest atom. There's one electron orbiting the nucleus, so you don't have any kind of interactions where one electron interferes with another, which are very, very difficult to mathematically model. Um, even in our modern models, we use these hydrogen-based calculations and then mathematically adapt or adjust them to um, to larger atoms. We don't try to solve larger atoms just from scratch. Um, Schrodinger's model is called the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Uh, quantum mechanics dealing with the um, laws of physics applying to um, the quantum scale or the subatomic world. Um, it turns out, and I think I mentioned this briefly yesterday, all of Newton's laws um, that apply to motions of objects of the real world, F equals MA, distance equals rate times time, all that good stuff, they found in, in playing around mathematically that none of that works for electrons. Uh, electrons don't follow Newton's laws. Uh, so it's kind of weird where what we thought the laws of physics applied to everything, it, they don't really apply to when you try to dig into what exactly electrons are doing when they go around the nucleus. So Schrodinger had to invent a new type of physics called quantum mechanics. And that new type of physics was built around this equation of the electron wave function. And when he did that, he found out what the electron was at least mathematically doing as it moves around the nucleus. Um, now, one thing that he kept from Bohr, well, that he didn't really keep, but it is, uh, evolved out of his equations that agreed with Bohr model. The electrons are limited to specific energy values. So that little ladder, low energy, medium energy, high energy, higher yet energy, and so on, that doesn't go away. The electrons still are limited to how much energy they can have, and they can't occupy the spaces in between. Um, the big difference is Bohr still tried to model the electron as a plane that's going around the nucleus. So you know exactly where the electron is at this point in its orbit, and, you know, and so on. Um, Schrodinger's model doesn't treat the electron as a particle. It treats it as a wave, whatever that might mean. Um, and so you have no idea where the electron is. Um, and that kind of is annoying because now you can't, I can't draw you a picture of this is what the atom looks like. 
it's some blurry, wavy region around the nucleus where the electron is kind of sort of there doing some stuff that we don't know what it is. Um, now, that sounds pretty vague, and why would that even be a useful you know, way of looking at things? Because, really, do you care where the electron is? You're never going to see one. They're too tiny. What you care about is how much energy does the electron have? How much energy does it take to rip the electron out of the atom and make an ion so it can become part of a compound? Um, and those energy values, those you can calculate exactly using Schrodinger's equation. So bottom line is Schrodinger said, you know what, let's just give up trying to find out where the electron is and how it's orbiting the nucleus because who cares? Let's focus our attention instead on what really matters, and that is the energy values uh, of the electrons around the nucleus. And his equation is extremely successful in calculating those energy values. Um, in fact, it's mathematically the most successful theory we've ever made of anything. It, it outdoes relativity by far in terms of you know number of decimal places of correct values. Um, but at the cost of now, we don't know what the atom looks like. But we can live with that because we got good math. And that's what really matters to scientists. So we don't know the exact path the electron is taking, as they say here, um, around the nucleus. So instead, we model it as a blurry electron cloud, okay? Um, so the important thing that it does is it tells us the energies the electron has, and that's what we care about. Now, um, this probability concept. Um, when Schrodinger came out with his, his theory, he said basically this is it. It's calculating energies, and that's all we care about. But people wanted to know where the electron is. Schrodinger's like, no, don't worry about that. But other scientists were like, well, I want to know. Uh, so what they came up with is this idea of probability. When you take Schrodinger's equation and kind of graph it, now, of course, notice you're used to graphing y equals f of x, um, you know, one variable versus one other variable. Um, Schrodinger's model was a three-dimensional model around the nucleus, so he didn't have just f of x. He had f of x, y, and z three variables in there. So it's a much, much more complex function, obviously. And then that means you can, rather than just picking an x value and plugging it in and getting your answer, you can pick an x, y, and z value, plug it in, get your answer. That x, y, and z values, those are the exact location of the, the electron. So start at the nucleus, which is the origin, move a certain position along the x-axis, then a certain position up along the y-axis, and then out along the z-axis. Okay, now you're at some place relative to the nucleus. Um, you can now plug in, plug those values in, and Schrodinger's equation gives you a number. What does that number mean? Schrodinger says, don't worry about it. I just want to calculate energies. But everyone else said, I want to know what that means. And what they figured out it means is probability of finding the electron at that point. So you might get a value at some x, y, and z value of 0.1. What that means is there's a 10% chance that you're going to find the electron at that point. Move to a different point, you might get 0.05. There's only a 5% chance of finding the electron at that new point. So we can't know where the electron is. But we can talk about the odds of where it might be, or more mathematically, the probability of where we might find it. Okay. Uh, by the way, some scientists like Albert Einstein hated this concept. One of his famous quotes is, I refuse to believe that God plays dice with the universe, meaning that you know nature doesn't ex exist in a probability fashion. It's deterministic. Um, but unfortunately for Einstein, these guys won out, and we do still today talk about electron clouds in terms of probabilities. All right, so here's that electron cloud I just mentioned. You got your nucleus in the middle. Up until now, we had a nice steady orbit around the nucleus. Even Bohr had set orbits. They were just limited to where they could be. Schrodinger's model says there's no such thing as an orbit. You don't know. So all you have is this blurry region around the nucleus. Now, in the, the textbook drawing here, they have a nice clean-cut boundary around the edge. In reality, it's more like a cloud that it kind of fades out and there's no edge to it. Um, so as you get away, the shading should just get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer rather than just cutting off right there. Uh, so these electron clouds are fuzzy, blurry, cloudy regions 
where you're most likely to find the electron. The darkness of the shading correlates with the probability. So in here, close to the nucleus, it's a darker shading. There's a higher probability you're going to find the nucleus, the electron there. Out here, further away, where the shading is dimmer, that just means there's a lower probability of finding the nucleus out there, or of finding the electron out there. The nucleus stays put, obviously. Um, so electron clouds are blurry regions where simply you're likely to find the electron somewhere in there. That's not a very satisfying description. We want to know where the electron is exactly, but we're not allowed to, according to Schrodinger. All we know is there's this blurry region where the electron is likely to be found. Okay, uh, the analogy I like to use is a bug splattered on your windshield. Where exactly is the bug? Well, it's spread around the whole windshield, or at least a region of the windshield. Maybe a certain percentage of it is in one place and another percent another, but it's all spread around. That's how the electron is. So you want to kind of get out of the idea of thinking of electrons as little tiny particles zipping around the nucleus. I know they told you that for years, but now it's not true anymore. Uh, think of the electron as smashed like a bug and smeared around the atom. You got your nucleus in the middle, then you got a smashed electron smeared around, forming a blurry, cloudy region. And that's what the atom more or less is like, at least according to Schrodinger's theory. And that's the theory we still use today, so we're going to live with it. Okay, so um, how are the, the models different? How are they the same? Um, they both have energy, um, discrete specific energy values. So just like Bohr, Schrodinger has an electron cloud for energy level one, the lowest level. Then if you jump up to energy level two, it might have a differently sized or shaped electron cloud. Jumps to level three, the electron cloud looks different again. They're not always spherical clouds like this. Sometimes they're different shapes, which we'll look at in a moment. So that's how they're the same. How they're different is you don't know where the electron is anymore. Now, um, those energy levels we've been talking about, uh, we call them principal energy levels, and we give them uh, something called a principal quantum number. And I know that that term is coming up here soon. Um, uh, don't use this concept of orbital yet. I'm getting to that. Um, there, the principal quantum number. That principal quantum number is simply the energy level we've been talking about. The first rung, the second rung, the third rung. So that's given the symbol N. It means principal quantum number. The first rung, n equals 1. The second rung, n equals 2, and so on. You can have up to a million, up to infinity, really. But usually we stick with electrons in up to 7 or so of the first levels, because that fills up the periodic table. Um, that's the principal quantum number. It's simply what energy level are you in. Now, what they found since there, though, you know, Bohr's model, that's all it had. Schrodinger's model has subdivisions of those levels, what we call sublevels. Now, those sublevels are given letter designations, okay? And those sublevels are S, P, D, and F, okay? Now, they're using the term orbital here. An orbital is a specific subdivision of the sublevels, okay? Now, the first type of sublevel is S. And it's spherical shaped, and there's only one of those. So there's one s orbital in an s sublevel, in a, in some energy level. Now you go to p sublevels. Notice they're shaped like two balloons stuck together at the nucleus. Um, that's the second sublevel. Turns out there's three different p sublevels, or th three different p orbitals in a sublevel. So here's your p sublevel. And it has this p orbital, that p orbital, and the third p orbital. Okay? D orbitals, there's five of those. And they don't show you pictures here. F orbitals, there's seven of those, and they're just lobes everywhere. I'm running low on time here, so I've got to cut this a little short. But there's your five different d orbitals. Now, notice level one only has an s. Level two has an s and a p. Level three has s, p, d. Level four has s, p, d, f. Um, and we'll stop there. Now, you'll have one or S orbital, three P orbitals, five Ds, and seven Fs. Um, each orbital can hold two electrons. Again, there's reasons for that, and maybe we'll get into it later. I'll, I'll see what I want to cover. But now this tells you how many electrons you can fit into each orbital. And it looks like I have only about 10 seconds left, so 
I'm just about done. I'll give you some work on this again tonight, and we'll take it from there tomorrow.